Hey guys, how you doing? I just wanted to jump on tonight and share some quick thoughts. I think this is going to be a real short video. I'm recording this on Wednesday, November 30th, and the United States beat Iran yesterday. We know that we'll be playing the Netherlands in the next round on Saturday morning. We also found out today that in Mexico has been eliminated, and this is going to leave the United States as the only CONCACAF nation to advance out of group stage. Um, I uh, I had some thoughts, in, in there, and they're pretty encouraging. Um, one thing that we're starting to gain perspective on now that we look back at the group stage is how impressive our defense has been in this World Cup. The United States has only given up one goal across three matches. And that one goal was on a penalty kick. And uh, I saw uh, Van highlighted this for me today on Twitter, but um, the United States joined the Netherlands and Tunisia as the only countries in this tournament that have given up one or fewer goals up to this point. And the United States is the only team to have not conceded any in open play. This is amazing. Now, let me put this in perspective for you, okay? And this is something that I, I haven't seen uh, widely mentioned, but but to, just to put this in perspective, with the modern era, I'm considering the modern era of the World Cup to date back to 1990. That's how I look at it because that was that was the first year the United States qualified for the World Cup after a 40-year absence from the tournament. And from 1990 to today, this year's tournament, um, that's that that stretch encompasses nine World Cups, and the United States has played in eight of them. And in these eight World Cups, the United States has only ever kept a clean sheet four times in a World Cup match. And two of those have come in the last week. Okay, this team has had two shutouts in a row, two clean sheets in a row. The only other times in the modern era that the United States has held an opponent scoreless in a World Cup match was against Mexico in 2002 and against Algeria in 2010. And that's it. That's Brad Friedel and Tim Howard as the goalkeepers. And now we've doubled that number in less than a week. And we've done it with Matt Turner. This is an incredible accomplishment. And let me tell you a little something about Matt Turner. He is someone who did not grow up playing soccer. He did not begin to play, did not even consider playing until he was in high school. And that's very late to begin playing this game. He was a, he was a baseball player and he decided to take it up late. And he, uh, ended up going to school and going to college at a very, very small private Jesuit college. And, um, and he went draft, he went undrafted for major league soccer. Well, oh, by the way, while he's in college in 2013, he made it onto sports center for their not top 10. He had an all time blunder in front of the net and, um, and it made, it made the, it made the not top 10 highlight reel, low light reel on Sports Center. That was nine years ago. To go from that to back-to-back -back shutouts in the World Cup is an amazing journey. He went undrafted out of college from this tiny little bitty school. He went undrafted out of college and he spent a long time not making the first team at New England. And when he was, when he, and, and then he was not the go even in 2019, as recent as 2019, he was not the locked in starter for the New England Revolution. And finally, they gave him his shot, and he and his his trajectory has just been absolutely he's just been skyrocketing ever since. And in three years from not being a starter in New England, three years later, he gets to transfer to Arsenal. And now we see him here. He's the undisputed number one goalkeeper on this squad. And he's had he's had back to back shutouts and has not allowed any open uh, open play goals at all. This is an amazing accomplishment for Matt Turner. Um, so, uh, but to um, of course, it's not it's not a one man show, right? Um, we're doing this with a defense that includes uh, a major league soccer player and Walker Zimmerman. I think I've already talked about this before, but I want to tell you a little bit about Tim Ream. You know, Tim Ream. 
like I said, spent a year not even involved in the qualifying process. And he just shows up out of the blue here for the World Cup, and he's been he's played every minute. And this occurred to me um, yesterday, and, and I think it really just clicked something into place for me. I've always wondered, you know, is what it takes to qualify in CONCACAF. Those that don't know the sport, CONCACAF is the region the United States comes from. It includes all of North America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And in this tournament, three nations from CONCACAF qualify automatically, and a fourth one played in a playoff spot um, for, for a possible fourth slot. And so... Um, CONCACAF plays in a very different style than Europe does, for example. And I've always wondered, is what it takes to qualify for the World Cup out of CONCACAF, does it require us to become something different than what we would need in order to succeed once we're at the World Cup? Because I think CONCACAF is so unique in its environment, its culture, and how it plays, that success there is probably not going to translate to success against big European clubs. And I think that's probably exactly what's happened with Tim Ream. He's someone whose style of play and whose strengths do not lend itself to CONCACAF opponents. I think maybe Burhalter recognized that. And he's, he, and, you know, Ream's 35. He probably needs to save some wear and tear on his body. And I'm just beginning to wonder if Burhalter didn't say, you know what, sit this out. And um, if we make it, you're in. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me, actually, and it and it and it makes me realize, you know what? M maybe, maybe there's a lot to that. Maybe some of these people that helped us in qualifying that didn't make this roster at all, maybe, maybe that the same logic applies to all of them. Maybe that's Ricardo Pepe. Maybe that's Paul Ariola. I don't know, um, but uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. If that maybe there is an acknowledgement, maybe maybe there is something to this idea that what it takes to succeed in Concacaf is something different from what it takes to succeed at the World Cup itself. And I think, uh, I think the Tim Ream story here for this tournament uh, might, might be a, a, a testament to that. Um, one thing that uh, I wanted, just the last thing I wanted to cover tonight was uh, I've got a little bit of feedback. First of all, I absolutely love all the feedback. I'm not getting it in the YouTube comments page, but I'm getting it personally from people. I, obviously I have a real small audience. I feel like I probably know uh, I probably can name each one of you, and I, I do appreciate uh, you watching and for giving me feedback and encouraging me. I do enjoy doing this, um, but the feed, some of the feedback I've gotten has been um, that maybe I'm being a little too uh, rose-colored glasses. I'm being a little too positive and not critical enough, particularly of Greg Berhalter, and um, that maybe I'm just being too enthusiastic and, and I'm gushing and I'm not really being cr critical in my thinking. Um, I do recognize his his faults, his shortcomings, our 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 shortcomings as a team, and um, and there are things that he's done and the way he's approached his job that I disagree with, um, and I'm so I'm just saying I'm not blind to any of that, but I just I'm not going to get toxic about it, right? I'm not here to to like nitpick and, and complain and be ugly. And I don't, I'm not someone who thinks that I'm going to, I'm going to prove my soccer knowledge by finding the one thing that's wrong and, and harping on that so that it shows my knowledge of the game. I mean, I'm going to choose to be glass half full and I'm going to be optimistic. I'll be positive. And I'm like, I'm having the time of my life. I'm enjoying this tournament. I love watching this team play and I, and I'm not going to do anything to take away from my own enjoyment of it. But I, I do, I can criticize Greg Burhalter. I do see some of those things. And I think I will talk about it on this channel, but I'm just not going to do it right now. Um, I'm going to wait until our tournament's over, probably, to tell you the truth. So, you know, stick with me on that. You know, I, 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 I'll just tell you in broad strokes right now, I think where he has maybe fallen short during this tournament so far is how he handles substitutions. I really don't understand his substitution decisions at all. And I don't think we're getting all the information on perhaps the health of some of the players on the field. I mean, on the bench. Um, we're starting to think that there must be something wrong with Reyna. I'm starting to think that there's, you know, someone like uh, Luca De La Torre who came in carrying an injury. He must not be fit enough to play. There's a lot of people on the bench that haven't gotten in yet. And um, 
and I'm worried. I mean, I'm, I just, I feel like uh, maybe th there are some restrictions there that we're not aware of that's affecting his substitution decisions. So I'm a little worried about how he's handled subs, but this is where you have to give Burhalter credit. He's had the team ready to play. They remain highly organized and intentional in how they play on the field, and that doesn't happen automatically. I mean, that, that's not that's not the players doing it in spite of Greg. I've seen that, you know, I've seen, you know, like he's you know, he's he's winning all these things as a national team manager. But they're like, but, but the team's winning in spite of him because that's how talented the players are. And he's holding them back. I mean, that might be true to some degree. But the thing is, the way they're playing on the field, that doesn't that doesn't happen automatically. That's well drilled and that's well trained. And there's a system in place that's working. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to give Burhalter credit. And you know what? The United States has given up zero open play goals, and we've made it into the group stage. Why complain? Why whine about it? Let's just be happy and excited and enjoy the run. Um, I've got more that I want to say tomorrow. I'm going to talk about um, my concerns for the depth, but also where we stand in terms of our, our chances uh, on Saturday. Um, I'm starting to get a little bit encouraged that we do have a chance. I think I stated that no one's given us a chance to win. That's probably an overstatement. I think no one's predicting us to win, but I, there are a lot of people acknowledging that we have a chance, and I think we do. Um, and so it's going to be exciting to see what happens. But I'll get into a little bit of that tomorrow. I don't want to go too long tonight. And I'm also going to try to um, see if I can find out about the Netherlands for you. Uh, I'm just so focused on the United States and focused on the group that we were in that um, I, I, I can't say that I know a lot about the Netherlands right now, but I'll see what I can find out. And um, maybe we can get an idea of uh, the type of game they're going to play and, um, and what kind of tactics or shape that we can expect to see on Saturday morning. Anyway, that's it for tonight. Just want to make it real quick. I hope I didn't go too long. Um, but anyway, uh, let's get ready for uh, Saturday morning's game. In the meantime, there are some more groups finishing out their third matches. So watch some soccer with me. And I'll talk to you next time.